you guys about the U.S. Oman Free Trade Agreement. Sort of a dull subject, but hopefully I can make a little bit intriguing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with our outline of what I'm going to discuss with everyone today. I'm going to start with some background, um, background to the Free Trade Agreement, sort of why it's beneficial for Oman, why the U.S. was interested in it. I'm also going to talk about the conditions or stipulations of the Free Trade Agreement. The second major topic I'm going to discuss are concerns that have arisen since its implementation. And lastly, I'm going to finish up with uh, what's next. So what does the free trade agreement mean for the future uh, for both the United States and for Oman? So I'm going to start out with some pictures of a very beautiful place. Uh, you can see very luscious vegetation, teal, blue waters. Uh, looks quite relaxing in this resort. Like, not necessarily what you think of when you think of Oman, which is a Gulf state, uh, very rocky. Um, some people might imagine a desert. It's actually quite humid there, but that's probably not what you think of when you think of it, regardless. Um, that's because it's not Oman. That's actually Zanzibar. And <laughs> the reason I bring up Zanzibar is actually because Oman ruled Zanzibar from 1698 until 1890. And actually, the sultan, who fell in love with the vistas, of course, moved the capital of Oman to Zanzibar, which, as you can see from the map, is quite far away. Um, but there was another big reason why Zanzibar was so appealing to Oman. Um, it was because, really, of its natural resources. At the time, the spice trade was very lucrative. So Zanzibar is full of spices it's in East Africa, so it has all the blessings of you know, stuff that you would find in, in India or around that area. Lots of curries, lots of um, strong spices. And then uh, also they had a lot of vanilla. So very lucrative at the time. Unfortunately, so was the slave trade. So Oman capitalized on that as well. Uh, in 1890, however, the British took over Zanzibar. Oman went back to Oman. <laughs> or the Sultan rather went back to Oman and they returned to an agrarian economy. So until 1964, Omanis were actually quite poor, very few natural resources in Oman. Um, however, in 1964, they found oil. And uh, in the past 30 years in particular, there have been uh, great strides towards economic development, industrialization. Omanis, as their median income, is quite well off. Uh, so one thing, though, that they're nervous of, of course, is because their economy is based on one commodity, 80% of their exports are oil. They would like to diversify their economy. Uh, one great way to diversify your economy, of course, is to attract foreign traders and investors, or rather encourage at least international trade. So it was appealing to them to forge a free trade agreement with the biggest economy in the world, of course, the United States. Uh, you might be wondering, however, why that would be beneficial for the United States, why we might be interested. Well, Oman has a couple of attractive features for us. It is part of the Gulf Cooperation Council, or the GCC. And the GCC is made up of the countries that are, what was purple at home, it's actually purple here, <laughs> but it's sort of that blue color, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, the United Arab Emirates. And we have really good trade relations with all of those countries. Oman is actually not part of OPEC, though. OPEC, we've had great volatile relations, past couple of decades, so it's appealing for us that they're part of a really friendly trade block. Um, a trade agreement with Oman is actually appealing as well because of an initiative that was started by George Bush in 2003. He sought to establish a Middle East free trade area uh, with the United States by 2013. Um, so far, we have free trade agreements with Morocco, Jordan, Israel, Oman, and Bahrain. So. We have a lot of free trade agreements in the Middle East that are pretty new. Um, however, it doesn't look we're going to get all 20 entities in the next year. But um, it was part of that initiative, so it was beneficial in that sense as well. Uh, the free trade agreement was effective January 2009. And since then, we've seen really great results uh, in terms of our trade numbers. The tariffs have been reduced by about 87%, and trade has increased between uh, the two countries by 90 so automatically, pretty rapid, fast, awesome, quick, positive effects. <laughs> um, some stipulations of the free trade agreement. Like any free trade agreement, of course, the elimination of trade barriers are key. 
Um, so reducing or eliminating import taxes, which are tariffs, um, subsidies, quotas, and um, another important aspect of uh, eliminating trade barriers is something called national treatment, um, which is known to the WTO as most favored nation status. Um, so that just means that we're on a level playing field with other GCC countries that our firms are considered um, on equal footing with online companies, there's no preference. Um, and in our free trade agreement, of course, we established some standards for um, government procurements and transparency in those transactions. So um, hopefully with a uh, established and documented legal framework, we could increase transparency. And some other stipulations included some reforms for labor. Um, like a lot of Gulf countries, Oman's labor force is predominantly expatriate. A lot of uh, their laborers are from South Asia and Africa. So we want to make sure they're treating them well. There's actually no labor unions to the two, until 2010. So we're, we'd like to think that the pressure from our Department of Labor and Department of Commerce and the International Labor Organization has something to do with that. Um, intellectual property rights have always been hard to define and govern and sort of protect. So we have some stipulations in the free trade agreement that take care of those. Uh, next, I want to talk about the concerns that have arisen since the implementation of the free trade agreements. This is my second major point. Um, there have been some discussions about whether or not there's been significant amounts of corruption. Um, with any newly industrializing economy, particularly one that's run by a monarchy, um, there's some concern about personal relationships getting to cloud um, you know, the awarding of contracts, for example. So that would be a direct violation of a free trade agreement, and hopefully you know, our transparency plans will uh, take care of that. However, there have been some protests. A population, uh, the population of Oman has taken to the streets a couple of times quite recently, um, jailing of two journalists for reporting on corruption. Uh, just how doing that. So um, the Emir actually rearranged his whole cabinet to satisfy people to make it seem like um, he's putting not corrupt people in power, so um, maybe that'll pan out nicely. Uh, preferential treatment, we've heard from the International Trade Commission that some of our companies have not received equal um, consideration when it comes to the awarding of particularly construction contracts, so that's one concern. The third concern, it's not so much a direct violation of the free trade agreement, but um, there's been it's been brought up by, again, some of our companies that there's been some language, indirect language in contracts that relate to or harken back to the 1945 Arab League boycott of Israeli products and services. So um, Oman officially says that that's not what's going on. Of course, that they've nothing in the government, especially government awarded contracts, would have any Arab League boycott language, but um, we're going to raise that hopefully soon. So um, what's next? What does this mean for the future of this free trade agreement and even the concerns that have arisen since then? Um, we want to ensure that the Oman-US relationship is healthy and that you know, trade is um, increasing between the two countries uh, continuously. And um, to do that, of course, we want to make sure that we iron out those problems. The new chairman of the Omani Tender Board is actually quite friendly to the United States, so um, we're hoping that his cooperation will be fruitful to that end. Um, there's some concern about Arab Springs spillover with the protests that were happening um, earlier this year. There was um, concern, particularly with traders and investors, that the environment in Oman might be unstable. So we're um, going to be closely monitoring that. Um, and of course, that instability might undermine the free trade agreement goals of increased trade and investment. Um, and then one more thing, which would kind of hinder the progress of the Middle East free trade area with the United States, is that the president right now does not have fast track authority, um, which what that means is that it's something that was signed by Congress a really long time ago that allows the president essentially to sign off on free trade agreements unilaterally um, with some amount of approval from the legislature, but it makes things go really fast. So when free trade agreements have to go through the House and the Senate and then be approved by the president, it takes much longer, and the Oman um, 
Free Trade Agreement was actually more controversial than CAFTA. So, um, but the President had fast track authority then, so it wasn't a big deal. It was able to push it on through. So it doesn't look like we're going to meet that um, MEFTA goal by 2013. So.